A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Second, The Golden Thread. Chapter 19, An Opinion. Worn out by anxious watching, Mr. Lorry fell asleep at his post. On the tenth morning of his suspense, he was startled by the shining of the sun into the room where a heavy slumber had overtaken him when it was dark night. He rubbed his eyes and roused himself, but he doubted when he had done so whether he was not still asleep. For going to the door of the doctor's room and looking in, he perceived that the shoemaker's bench and tools were put aside again, and that the doctor himself sat reading at the window. He was in his usual morning dress, and his face, which Mr. Lorry could distinctly see, though still very pale, was calmly studious and attentive. Even when he had satisfied himself that he was awake, Mr. Lorry felt giddily uncertain for some few moments whether the late shoemaking might not be a disturbed dream of his own, for did not his eyes show him his friend before him in his accustomed clothing and aspect, and employed as usual, and was there any sign within their range that the change of which he had so strong an impression had actually happened? It was but the inquiry of his first confusion and astonishment, the answer being obvious. If the impression were not produced by a real corresponding and sufficient cause, how came he, Jarvis Lorry, there? How came he to have fallen asleep in his clothes on the sofa in Dr. Manet's consulting room, and to be debating these points outside the doctor's bedroom door in the early morning? Within a few minutes, Miss Pross stood whispering at his side. If he had had any particle of doubt left, her talk would of necessity have resolved it, but he was by that time clear-headed and had none. He advised that they should let the time go by until the regular breakfast hour, and should then meet the doctor as if nothing unusual had occurred. If he appeared to be in his customary state of mind, Mr. Lorry would then cautiously proceed to seek direction and guidance from the opinion he had been in his anxiety so anxious to obtain. Miss Pross, submitting herself to his judgment, the scheme was worked out with care. Having abundance of time for his usual methodical toilette, Mr. Lorry presented himself at the breakfast hour in his usual white linen and with his usual neat leg. The doctor was summoned in the usual way and came to breakfast. So far as it was possible to comprehend him without overstepping those delicate and gradual approaches which Mr. Lorry felt to be the only safe advance, he at first supposed that his daughter's marriage had taken place yesterday. An incidental allusion purposely thrown out to the day of the week and the day of the month set him thinking and counting, and evidently made him uneasy. In all other respects, however, he was so composedly himself that Mr. Lorry determined to have the aid he sought, and that aid was his own. Therefore, when the breakfast was done and cleared away, and he and the doctor were left together, Mr. Lorry said feelingly, "'My dear Manet, I am anxious to have your opinion in confidence on a very curious case in which I am deeply interested.' That is to say, it is very curious to me. Perhaps to your better information it may be less so. Glancing at his hands, which were discolored by his late work, the doctor looked troubled and listened attentively. He had already glanced at his hands more than once. Dr. Manet, said Mr. Lorry, touching him affectionately on the arm, the case is the case of a particularly dear friend of mine. Pray, give your mind to it, and advise me well for his sake and above all for his daughter's. "'His daughters, my dear Manet.' "'If I understand,' said the doctor in a subdued tone, "'some mental shock?' "'Yes.' "'Be explicit,' said the doctor. "'Spare no detail.' "'Mr. Lorry saw that they understood one another and proceeded. "'My dear Manet, "'it is the case of an old and a prolonged shock "'of great acuteness and severity to the affections, "'the feelings, the... "'The, as you express it, the mind. "'The mind. "'It is the case of a shock under which the sufferer was borne down. "'One cannot say for how long, because I believe he cannot calculate the time himself. "'And there are no other means of getting at it. "'It is the case of a shock from which the sufferer recovered by a process that he cannot trace himself. "'As I once heard him publicly relate in a striking manner.' "'It is the case of a shock from which he has recovered so completely "'as to be a highly intelligent man, "'capable of close application of mind and great exertion of body "'and of constantly making fresh additions to his stock of knowledge, "'which was already very large. Uh, "'But unfortunately there has been,' he paused and took a deep breath, "'a slight relapse.' "'The doctor, in a low voice, asked, 
of how long duration? Nine days and nights. How did it show itself? I infer, glancing at his hands again, in the resumption of some old pursuit connected with the shock? That is the fact. Now, did you ever see him? asked the doctor, distinctly and collectedly, though in the same low voice, engaged in that pursuit originally. Once. And when the relapse fell on him, was he in most respects, or in all respects, as he was then? I think in all respects. You spoke of his daughter. Does his daughter know of the relapse? No, it has been kept from her, and I hope will always be kept from her. It is known only to myself and to one other who may be trusted. The doctor grasped his hand and murmured, That was very kind. That was very thoughtful. Mr. Lorry grasped his hand in return, and neither of the two spoke for a little while. Now, my dear Manet, said Mr. Lorry at length, in his most considerate and most affectionate way, I am a mere man of business, and unfit to cope with such intricate and difficult matters. I do not possess the kind of information necessary. I do not possess the kind of intelligence. I want guiding. There is no man in this world on whom I could so rely for right guidance as on you. Tell me, how does this relapse come about? Is there danger of another? Could a repetition of it be prevented? How should a repetition of it be treated? How does it come about at all? Uh, what can I do for my friend? No man ever can have been more desirous in his heart to serve a friend than I am to serve mine, if I knew how. But I don't know how to originate in such a case. If your sagacity, knowledge, and experience could put me on the right track, I might be able to do so much. Unenlightened and undirected, I can do so little. Pray, discuss it with me. Pray, enable me to see it a little more clearly and teach me how to be a little more useful. Dr. Manet sat meditating after these earnest words were spoken, and Mr. Lorry did not press him. "'I think it probable,' said the doctor, breaking silence with an effort, "'that the relapse you have described, my dear friend, was not quite unforeseen by its subject.' "'Was it dreaded by him?' Mr. Lorry ventured to ask. "'Very much,' he said it with an involuntary shudder. "'You have no idea how such an apprehension weighs on the sufferer's mind, "'and how difficult, how almost impossible it is for him to force himself "'to utter a word upon the topic that oppresses him.' "'Would he,' asked Mr. Lorry, "'be sensibly relieved if he could prevail upon himself "'to impart that secret brooding to anyone when it is on him?' "'I think so, but it is as I have told you next to impossible. "'I even believe it, in some cases, to be quite impossible.' "'Now,' said Mr. Lorry, gently laying his hand on the doctor's arm again "'after a short silence on both sides, "'to what would you refer this attack?' "'I believe,' returned Dr. Manet, "'that there had been a strong and extraordinary revival "'of the train of thought and remembrance that was the first cause of the malady. "'Some intense associations of a most distressing nature "'were vividly recalled, I think. "'It is probable that there had long been a dread lurking in his mind "'that those associations would be recalled, "'say, under certain circumstances, uh, say, on a particular occasion.' He tried to prepare himself in vain. Perhaps the effort to prepare himself made him less able to bear it. Would he remember what took place in the relapse? asked Mr. Lorry with natural hesitation. The doctor looked desolately round the room, shook his head, and answered in a low voice, Not at all. Now, as to the future, hinted Mr. Lorry. As to the future said the doctor, recovering firmness. I should have great hope. As it pleased heaven in its mercy to restore him so soon, I should have great hope. He, uh, yielding under the pressure of a complicated something long dreaded and long vaguely foreseen and contended against, and recovering after the cloud had burst and passed, I should hope that the worst was over. Well, well, that's good comfort. I am thankful said Mr. Lorry. 
I am thankful, repeated the doctor, bending his head with reverence. There are two other points, said Mr. Lorry, on which I am anxious to be instructed. I may go on. You cannot do your friend a better service. The doctor gave him his hand. To the first, then. He is of a studious habit and unusually energetic. He applies himself with great ardor to the acquisition of professional knowledge, to the conducting of experiments, uh, to many things. Now, does he do too much? I think not. It may be the character of his mind to be always in singular need of occupation. That may be in part natural to it, in part the result of affliction. The less it was occupied with healthy things, the more it would be in danger of turning in the unhealthy direction. He may have observed himself and made the discovery. You are sure that he is not under too great a strain? I think I am quite sure of it. My dear Manet, if he were overworked now... My dear Laurie, I doubt if that could easily be. There has been a violent stress in one direction, and it needs a counterweight. Excuse me, as a persistent man of business, assuming for a moment that he was overworked, it would show itself in some renewal of this disorder? I do not think so. I do not think, said Dr. Monet with the firmness of self-conviction, that anything but the one train of association would renew it. I think that henceforth nothing but some extraordinary jarring of that cord could renew it. After what has happened and after his recovery, I find it difficult to imagine any such violent sounding of that string again. I trust and I almost believe that the circumstances likely to renew it are exhausted." He spoke with the diffidence of a man who knew how slight a thing would overset the delicate organization of the mind, and yet with the confidence of a man who had slowly won his assurance out of personal endurance and distress. It was not for his friend to abate that confidence. He professed himself more relieved and encouraged than he really was, and approached his second and last point. He felt it to be the most difficult of all. But remembering his old Sunday morning conversation with Miss Pross, and remembering what he had seen in the last nine days, he knew that he must face it. The occupation resumed under the influence of this passing affection so happily recovered from, said Mr. Lorry, clearing his throat, we will call um, blacksmith's work. Blacksmith's work. Uh, we will say to put a case, and for the sake of illustration, that he had been used in his bad time to work at a little forge. We will say that he was unexpectedly found at his forge again. Is it not a pity that he should keep it by him? The doctor shaded his forehead with his hand and beat his foot nervously on the ground. He has always kept it by him, said Mr. Lorry, with an anxious look at his friend. Now, would it not be better that he should let it go? Still, the doctor, with shaded forehead, beat his foot nervously on the ground. "'You do not find it easy to advise me?' said Mr. Lorry. "'I quite understand it to be a nice question, and yet I think—' And there he shook his head and stopped. "'You see,' said Dr. Manet, turning to him after an uneasy pause, "'it is very hard to explain, consistently, the innermost workings of this poor man's mind.' He once yearned so frightfully for that occupation, and it was so welcome when it came. No doubt it relieved his pain so much by substituting the perplexity of the fingers for the perplexity of the brain, and by substituting, as he became more practiced, the ingenuity of the hands for the ingenuity of the mental torture, that he has never been able to bear the thought of putting it quite out of his reach." Even now, when I believe he is more hopeful of himself than he has ever been, and even speaks of himself with a kind of confidence, the idea that he might need that old employment and not find it gives him a sudden sense of terror, uh, like that which one may fancy strikes to the heart of a lost child. He looked like his illustration as he raised his eyes to Mr. Lorry's face. "'But may not mind. I ask for information, a plodding man of business who only deals with such material objects, guineas, shillings, and banknotes. May not the retention of the thing involve the retention of the idea? If the thing were gone, my dear Manet, 
Might not the fear go with it? In short, is it not a concession to the misgiving to keep the forge? There was another silence. You see, too, said the doctor tremulously, it is such an old companion. I would not keep it, said Mr. Lorry, shaking his head, for he gained in firmness as he saw the doctor disquieted. I would recommend him to sacrifice it. I only want your authority. I am sure it does no good. Come, give me your authority like a dear good man, for his daughter's sake, my dear Manet. Very strange to see what a struggle there was within him. In her name, then, let it be done. I sanction it, but I would not take it away while he was present. Let it be removed when he is not there. Let him miss his old companion after an absence. Mr. Lorry readily engaged for that, and the conference was ended. They passed the day in the country, and the doctor was quite restored. On the three following days he remained perfectly well, and on the fourteenth day he went away to join Lucy and her husband. The precaution that had been taken to account for his silence, Mr. Lorry had previously explained to him, and he had written to Lucy in accordance with it, and she had no suspicions. On the night of the day on which he left the house, Mr. Lorry went into his room with a chopper, saw, chisel, and hammer, attended by Miss Pross carrying a light. There, with closed doors and in a mysterious and guilty manner, Mr. Lorry hacked the shoemaker's bench to pieces, while Miss Pross held the candle as if she were assisting at a murder for which, indeed, in her grimness, she was no unsuitable figure. The burning of the body, previously reduced to pieces convenient for the purpose, was commenced without delay in the kitchen fire, and the tools, shoes, and leather were buried in the garden. So wicked do destruction and secrecy appear to honest minds, that Mr. Lorry and Miss Pross, while engaged in the commission of their deed and in the removal of its traces, almost felt and almost looked like accomplices in a horrible crime. The end of Book the Second, Chapter 19 of A Tale of Two Cities. Read by Rick.